What is happening? How's everybody doing? We got some juice. Oh, boy, oh, boy, oh, boy. Tim Federer, he wants out on bail, on bond. He wants to get out before he is sentenced on November 16th. And wow, what a treat this is going to be. My goodness. Is he going to get let out or is not? Now, the audio on this, as soon as that judge starts talking, man, it's it's pretty loud. Well, let's see what his attorneys have got to say. All right, court is in session. Court called up the matter of uh, State versus Fader. When we hear a motion to set bond, we have appearances, please. And there's really nothing I can do about it. He is just eating that mic. Yeah, Mr. Ferrer, Wyatt, Ferrer's president. All right, court notes that Mr. Ferrer is president in the jury box. Um, all right, Ms. Wyatt, it's your motion. Um, you may proceed. Uh, Judge, we're asking for a bond pre-sentence for Mr. Ferrer. He was charged in this matter by information in March of 22. He was out on bond on a $50,000 bond is my understanding from then up until the end of the trial. He never missed a court appearance. He appeared as the court required either live or by Zoom for every appearance that was required by the court. Currently the sentencing is set for November 16th. It's less than a month away. It would be of great assistance to the defense for Mr. Fierder to be out of custody in order to assist in our preparation for the sentencing hearing. He currently is um, able to put forth a bond package of $100,000 monetary bond, surrender his passport, and provide a uh, and the and is willing to, to use a GPS monitor, level one. Okay. Anything else, Mr. Wayne? Do you intend to put on any evidence in regard to this motion? I am not. I'm relying on the fact that the, the docket reflects the fact that Mr. Fairdo has never missed court. The purpose of bond is to continue to make sure that the defendant appears for court. Uh, there is no doubt that Mr. Fairdo is going to appear for his sentencing hearing. He's appeared all the way through and continues to um, intend to comply with all of the court orders. Uh, I would also point out that he does not have any custody of the children and therefore there is no issue there um we we are as i said preparing for testament for for the sentencing and we may be um, needing to prepare his statements as well all right so um even though you're not going to put on any evidence um let me have you at least um speak to the issue of flight risk because that's obviously the, the, the central issue to a court anytime you're um, considering uh, post-conviction release whether it's uh, pending sentencing or even after um, or pending appeal um, i don't know anything about the defendant's background in the sense of what his um, financial resources are what his uh, travel experience is that guides me and, and informs me as to whether he could be a flight risk or not. And so are, are you going to give me any um, enlightenment as to that, uh, you know, through the evidence? Because the, the cases that I've read on this tell me that I can't just draw a conclusory um, determination that a defense, um, that, that, excuse me, that a defendant is a flight risk, that I have to base it on uh, specific evidence. But in this type of motion, the motion burden would be with the defendant, right? Do you agree with that? I do, which is why in order to deal with that issue, because from our position in terms of a bond request, we'd have to be able to deal with that issue in our bond package, of which that includes surrender of passport, which I'm prepared to do today. I have it with me. I'm also uh, be able to tell the court where he'll be residing. I don't want to do it right now in open court at the address, but it would be in Palm Beach County. Oh my God, look at him. He looks awful. How long has he been in? It's been almost 
two weeks since he was sentenced. I mean, not sentenced, but the end of the trial. And he's shaking. He could be freezing, but man, he looks like hell. Oh, my God. I guess he didn't like being locked up either. He would be under the jurisdiction of this county. He would also, as I said, have a GPS oh monitor level one. And so all of the issues related to flight risk can be managed through what I've been proposing. Um, I do think that, uh, and I'm sure the court is aware that he has uh, lived in yeah. another state at some point. Uh, so th in terms of travel and that sort of thing, there's no intention to leave the state of Florida. In fact, not even leave the county of Palm Beach. All right, anything else, Mr. White? Uh, no, not at this time, Judge. All right, he Ms. looks Copeland. like shit. All right, Your there is uh, one case that I was able to find on it. I'll provide it to the state, which is Craft B State. And that case basically stands for the proposition that it's in the discretion of the court. Um, I can provide it to you. No, I have it. I already have it, and I, I've read it. Um, um, and the thing that says that we look at is flight risk as well as um, they said that was an important consideration was whether or not there was a, a mandatory prison sentence in this case there is that speak, speak to me in that way because we're obviously not at sentencing yet but um in looking at craft and also i think it was a, the Cheatham versus novell decision um um one of the things that i can consider is whether there is a mandatory sentence involved because that informs on the issue of potential flight risk. So tell me what, um, without obviously um, us being at the sentencing hearing at this point, tell me what the mandatories are that we are looking at here. The bottom of the guidelines in this case um, is 75 months. 75 months. Oh crap. Transgender. It's made very- That's- um, Sorry about that. A little over six years. Correct, Your Honor. And obviously, Your Honor has discretion all the way up to 40 years in the Department of Corrections, which is a substantially significant posture than when the defendant was on pretrial, especially since um, the state, first of all, he's convicted, and uh, second, there's additional charges here. He was on pretrial release as to two charges. Um, immediately before trial, the state added a third charge. So that's a fundamental difference in his position, besides the fact that he's been convicted, and now that there's a mandatory prison sentence. That creates a substantial risk of a flight risk, Your Honor, that was not present um, yeah. before, and also leans against that it would be appropriate for pretrial, pre-sentencing release. I think, Your Honor, as your honor knows it's an incredibly rare thing for there to be a pre-sentence release um, there are very specific guidelines that d dictate post-sentence release um, but this type of posture is incredibly rare and i cannot think of a case in my career where there was a pre-sentence release i tend to agree with you but i uh, in anticipation of this hearing i did a significant amount of research myself and i was already familiar with the craft decision it is in your discretion. Yeah, that is the, but the, the accurate statement of the law. Is yeah, you could do it. it. It is, and let me tell you, I don't know if you reviewed the Batiste versus State decision. That's at 134 Southern 3rd, 1025. And this is a decision that, because my general feeling of the law was what you've just stated. It is exceptionally rare to grant um, bond uh, pre-sentencing. But in the Batiste case, the court made a couple statements, and one of those statements that gives me some concern in terms of what I have to decide here is um, the exercise of that discretion. And basically, the, the, the Batiste decision said that a trial court judge does not satisfy the requirement to make written findings in support of denial of post-trial release, because if I deny this, I have to do a written order. Uh, by merely making conclusory findings unsupported by the record. Um, rather, the rule governing such motion in the Youngman's decision, which is where the uh, uh, post-conviction guidance comes from in terms of uh, um, bail or bond pending appeal, on which is the rule is based, uh, embody the Supreme Court's determination that deci decisions regarding post-trial release must be reasoned and therefore a mere verbatim recital of the considerations in Maryland will not suffice to fulfill the requirements. And so what I think that that tells me is I can't just draw the conclusory or, um, or make a conclusory allegation that he's a flight risk. I have to be able to point to evidence in the record that would substantiate the conclusion that he's a flight risk. And so with that in mind, tell me from the state standpoint, 
I mean, I think you've already pointed to one, the, the, the minimum that uh, sentence that he's facing, um, the guidelines, and then the maximum up to 40 years. Are there other factors that would um, weigh in um, support of the state's position that there's additional evidence like um, not sufficient ties to the community, uh, world traveler, those kinds of things that would affect my decision. There are, Your Honor, and I think that part of this is it's the defense's motion, and so they should bear the evidentiary burden of establishing that he's not a flight risk. He came to trial and came to prior court dates is not, I think, a sufficient legal basis for Your Honor to conclude that he's not a flight risk, right? They have the evidentiary burden before them that the state has to rebut that. But I would say based on the information that we have in this case, the defendant um, has huge international contacts. His very close friend flew from Australia for the purpose of testifying on his behalf. And so he has contacts throughout the world who have made extraordinary efforts to be in support of him. In addition, the defendant has resided internationally. He resided in Spain for a period of time um, during the time when he, with the children um, at a certain point. And so and I also think as to say that he's a flight risk, there is no local residence. The defendant, the home that was at issue in this case was sold. Uh, there, the, based on the information the state has, we have no indication that he owns any local property in Palm Beach County. The defense has not provided the address of where he will be living um, so that there can be any checks as to the ties there. He also is not the one that posted the monetary bond in this case. The bondsman was supplanted in this case by a friend who posted the entirety of the bond. And so the financial risk here is not the defendant's, it's some. It's one of his supporters. Um, and so that is a consideration as to whether or not a bond would be a, a, an appropriate check here because he doesn't have a local residence. He doesn't have any financial involvement in the bond if it's being posted by a friend. All of those are, are considerations. In addition, the defense has um, articulated that he doesn't have any continuing contact with the children. That is just not true. The youngest child in this case was adopted by his co-defendant's parents, and that he's had continuing contact with that child um, even since he's been in custody. Um, and so there is a substantial risk, and I think it's important to note that that child was removed from his custody by the Department of Children and Families. That dependency case closed when the adoption took place. And so he, there's a risk even that he'll have continuing contact with a minor child or even be living in a home with a minor child. We don't know that because the state, the defense hasn't provided any evidentiary support for where he'll be living, who he'll be willing left, and whether or not, not only we can prevent him from fleeing, but we can protect the community from someone who has now been convicted of multiple crimes against a child. Um, and so based on all of that, I don't think that they've reached their evidentiary burden, but there's substantial support for the idea that um, he has a risk, um, especially in consideration in light of the bottom of the guidelines in this case in a mandatory prison sentence. Okay. All right. Thank you. Ms. Coakley. Damn, that was brutal. I don't think he's going to get out. I don't know how the judge is going to roll, but shit. He's got friends all over the world. My God. They've spared no expense to help him. He's done sold his house. Damn. That's brutal. Uh, rebuttal, Mr. White. Hey, y'all. Oh, crap. Is Lita Hakeem Jeff? So, I'm familiar with crap. The issue in terms of burden to start with is it's our burden to deal with the securing of his return to court, which is the entire purpose of bond. And we are dealing with that through the issues that we brought up as to surrendering his passport and a GPS monitor and that he will be residing in Palm Beach County. In terms of the address, I'm happy to provide the address to the state. I'm happy to have them go and do a, whatever they need to do to make sure that there's no, no child at the house or anything of that nature. In terms of um, the the bond amount, there's nothing in the case law that says it, whether who puts up the money. That's a, that is irrelevant. And in terms of who... Why is it irrelevant? Because bond is typically, uh, it puts it creates financial exposure for the defendant putting up the bond or for his family that's putting up the bond. Uh, if he's not the one that put up the bond, why isn't that a factor I can consider uh, in the sense that um, the normal uh, scenario where the defendant would feel the financial pressure of the bond doesn't exist here if someone else has put it up. Well, because it, first of all, the, even if it, in, as to the 
previous bond. This is what we're talking about, right? The $50,000 bond. Sure. So clearly, he did continue to come to court on that. So the evidence in the record is that it did work. He did continue to come to court all the way through trial. So th there's no issue that I, I don't think the state's even saying that he missed a court date. So there's no issue that that didn't work. Of course it worked. We know. We're, we're, we went all through the process. But the, the scenario is radically different now, uh, post-conviction. Do, do you agree with the representations by Ms. Coakley that the defendant has sold his home uh, in Jupiter that was his residence at the start of this trial, and he no longer owns a residence here in Palm Beach County? Judge. And while you're asking, uh, meeting with your client, I'd like to also know, do you uh, agree with Ms. Coakley's representations that the defendant has lived in Spain for a period of time with his children? He looks like he's lost a lot of weight. He looks terrible. Is that a tattoo on his arm? He ain't like in jail at all. He looks terrible. So as I think it did come out even in, in the trial, and so the state knows that uh, Mr. Ferrer did live in Spain, but that was in 2009. And that issue of international travel is remedied by both the surrender of passport and a GPS level one monitor. In terms of does he own a home, uh, in, he does not at this point own a home. It is not the first time somebody who doesn't own a home though can still, you know, live somewhere and uh, not be in custody during the pendency of the case. Um, we're looking at a relatively short span of time that we're asking for. We're asking for from now till November 16th. So um, I think that steps can be made to deal with any additional concerns the court may have, but flight risk should not be one because with no passport and a GPS monitor, the, the court would be uh, informed of any violation of that uh, situation. And if he's in Palm Beach County, he's under the jurisdiction of the court the entire time. So I do think that is remedied. In terms of the issue of is the mandatory sentencing, my understanding of the years I've been doing the mandatory sentencing, what we're talking about is if there's a minimum mandatory statutory minimum. There really isn't here. There's a guidelines range, and the bottom of that guidelines range is as the state just put out. But do that, you agree that it's 75 months as represented uh, by Ms. Coakley? I have no idea what it is. No reason to. I have no reason to doubt it. I just don't know what it is. Uh, I let the state score, folks. I don't really bother. But I will say this that the court can downward depart, the court can upward depart. The court has full discretion at sentencing. The court knows that. So there's no minimum mandatory in that sense. So we've dealt with both the issue of flight risk. We've dealt with the state's issue as to that the circumstances have dramatically changed. The only additional charge, which was put on, I think, a week before the trial, was the, uh, the neglect charge, which is an F3. It doesn't substantially change the score, quite frankly. Um, and I do think that it's important to note that we're looking at a very relatively short time frame that we're talking about before we get to sentencing. But it's a relatively short time frame that follows the conviction. Um, Are you a low-income oh, American on food stamps or Medicaid? The court on the charges. So uh, you, I'm, I know I'm telling you what you already know, that radically changes the calculus between pre-conviction, pre-trial, and the considerations that I look at um, um, post-conviction. I mean, the risk of flight is, is always an issue even in pretrial, but once the adjudication occurs, it's something that we really have to look at at that point because now we've passed the precipice of an adverse jury verdict at this point. So uh, any uh, additional argument that you wish to make on any of the points that we've raised? Any other factors in Youngins that you would ask that I consider? And, I, I, I get that Youngman's is the standard for um, bond pending appeal, but uh, some of the cases I've read said the same considerations are appropriate uh, for bond pending sentencing as well. 
Well, I think Youngins and, and his progeny really also talk about the fact that what is the purpose of the bond? The purpose is to ensure the defendant comes to court when the court requests it. And I think you can look at, in terms of evidentiary value, the record in this case going back to March of 22, where, as I've said a few times now, he's never missed a court appearance. I, I think that this, the, hy the hypothesizing of what might happen should be better predicated upon what's already happened. And so we know he's come to court. We know that he, whether he was in state or out of state, he made those, he made those appearances. In terms of the bond, whomever put up the bond in the past doesn't have to be who puts it up in the future. If the court wants some assurance that Mr. Ferrer is participating in putting up money of his own in, in this bond, we can put that as a condition. But I do think that it would be of great assistance to the defense to prepare in this short span of time for the sentencing to have uh, better access to Mr. Farrader between now and November 16th. Okay. All right, thank you. Court is going to take this under advisement. My review of the case law and of the rule tells me that I need to make specific findings in regard to my uh, ruling on this motion. So that's going to require that I put together a written order. And uh, I will... Um, um, move promptly to get an order out as quickly as possible, but it's not something that I can rule from the bench without doing what the cases tell me. And the rule tells me draft an order with findings to support whatever my ruling is. So, um, anything else I need to address bef um, before we recess on this hearing? Uh, no. Okay. okay. All right, good enough then. Court is in recess. Thank you. Listing your house on the market is... I wish there was a lot of ads in that. I'm so sorry. I was wrapped up in the um, what they were saying. He is a horrible attorney. He was just as bland as he was during the trial. She got up and spit off. No, nah, he's got friends all over the world. He's a flight risk. He, he don't need to be associating with his co-defendant. Do y'all need to go and get near the other kid because her parents adopted it? I said it. Adopted the child? I mean, damn, blame. She was like, bam, 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 bam. And then he's like, well, he was, he, he showed up to court. And the judge says, well, hey, this is all different now. He, he's going to, he's going to be sentenced. There's going to be jail time. It's different. Well, he gets up. He's. It's not really any different. He hasn't shown. In I was like, really, this guy is horrible. I don't know what else he could get up and say. That's all he's got. I, that's all he's got. But it was terrible. I mean, if they can figure it out, but uh, let me know what y'all think. Should they let him out? It's what two weeks? What is uh today? Today is what the uh, the nineteenth. To the 16th of November. I mean, he might as well just stay in and that'd be an extra couple of weeks added to what he's, you know, to his time. I don't know. I mean, he could get a lot of time. I don't know. This judge is tough, y'all. That one, it was like, what, six or seven years? And then there were some other charges pending. Not pending, but he was charged with. That time could be added on for those. I mean, damn. He's going to serve some time. I think this judge is going to. He ain't going to be easy on him. I don't know. I just got this funny feeling. And I don't think he's going to let him out. But anyway. Let me know what you guys think, man. And peace out.